Hey everybody, this is Jacob Stoops and we are here with episode 27. I'm here with my brand new co-host, Mr. Jeff Luella. How's it going, Hello, Jeff? It's doing pretty well. How's everyone else doing? And uh, for the first, uh, first time, it's me, co-host, and also we have a special guest. And today's special guest is going to be Mr. Simon Cox from Across the Pond. How are you doing, Simon? I'm doing very well, thank you, chaps. Uh, lovely to see you and hear you. So I know nothing uh, uh, about locations in the UK other than I, I believe you're in London, so I'm just a stupid American. So where exactly are you located? Not in London. Not in London. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to live in the south of London. I moved about 30 miles south of that. Uh, the UK is about the size of Manhattan. Um, so distances here, while they're big to us, are tiny to you guys. You, you, you'll travel for a day or two just to visit somebody. Um, you know, an hour or more on a train for us is, is forever. Um, mm. So, yeah, England's quite big. But, uh, yes, I'm about due south of, uh, of um, London town uh, in a small village of about 4,000 people called Lingfield. has a very famous horse racing course, which my office actually overlooks. It's very awesome. nice. That's yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I feel like everything is uh is just generally smaller over in uh I don't what do I say Europe? European Union, not so much with Brexit. But... Yeah, no, no, you can say <laughs> Europe because even if we if Brexit happens, we're still part of Europe on the geographical <laughs> Right, right, right. You know, unless somebody digs a great big trench and shifts us out into the Atlantic, uh we, we're geologically <laughs> still part of Europe. So let's jump right into it. So like the point of this podcast is going to continue to be the origin stories of great SEOs, as well as like the day to day, like this is what it's actually like. So Simon, take us through your career, who you are, how you got into SEO, like tell us, tell us about yourself. SEO. I oh, sorry, I thought this was a church podcast. Uh, <laughs> so I was going to do a bit some Leviticus 18. So you uh, did listen to my big wonder. Google. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> no, I thought that was very funny on the last uh, <laughs> Um I started off uh, from sort of career-wise in art college. Uh, and I did technical illustration at art college and some graphic design, etc. I did four years of that, sort of degree level, but not actual degree. Uh, and from there, I, I was working in studios, creating artwork for print, etc. This is years before the internet happened uh, to the public. That was obviously off with the army, etc. Before that, um, uh, and I was one of the first people in the country to use Quark Express, the page layout program. Uh, and that got me up to London uh, and working there and headhunted all over the place. And eventually, after about two months, <laughs> uh, I got headhunted by Midland Bank uh, because I wanted somebody to do their artwork for their things like checkbooks and credit cards and stuff like that. So I started working for those, uh, for them. And within uh, four years or so, uh, I became aware of the internet becoming uh, something. Uh, I was already on bulletin boards. So I was a big cyberpunk novel reader at the time. Uh, so I was very much into that. I was looking at future stuff. And, uh, and I thought this web seems very interesting. It looks a lot more interesting than the bulletin boards that I was getting involved with. Um, so I managed to get myself onto a Pipex. I don't know if you remember Pipex. They were uh, um, an ISP at the time. They disappeared many, many years ago. Um, they were doing a course on HTML. So I managed to persuade my boss at the time to uh, send me off on this. Uh, God knows how I did that. Uh, he was a very nice guy. I think I took him out for a beer. Um, and built my first website in about 96, beginning of 96, end of 95, or maybe start of 95 actually, uh, 96, about then. Um, and the rest is history. Uh, and for as far as SEO goes, uh, I really started optimizing for Alta Vista, which uh, was the big thing at the time. Yeah, good old days. And it was like keywords, bang, that's it, that'll do. And there was about 400 websites at the time, so we all knew each other, uh, which is good. Um, and, uh, where do we go from that? Um, really, I actually wasn't doing that full time at that time. I was still doing, uh, graphic design and artwork and stuff and running a, I built up a team doing that, uh, from me to about eight people. Um, and, uh, I had a bit of a falling out with the new boss they brought in. 
uh, she wasn't she was completely out of her depth and she, she and I did get on well so after about two weeks of that uh, I uh, well a good friend of mine in the in the business um, said oh <laughs> there's this uh, job going um, in group HBC group because uh, middle bank became HBC group at that point and um, they wanted somebody to uh, design and build hbcgroup.com uh, which in 99 became hbc.com um, once the group one had been bought out I god knows how much they spent on that it wasn't that much in those days compared with now but uh, I'm sure it was a lot they uh, they couldn't get the uh, HBC net was owned by Hunter Street Baptist Church in the States uh, so we were, we were told not to try and get that <laughs> it was politically uh, a, a bit sensitive so was like, leave that alone um, that'd be fine so yes yeah, so I um, uh, picked up hbc.com oh HB group and hbc.com and I was literally building the website walking around the corner to the um, uh, HR team not HR team sorry the uh, PR team uh, to get the uh, what's going on the marketing and stuff etc and they would give me new stories and what's going on with HBC group at the time and I would literally hand code it into uh, some notepads and eventually got Dreamweaver I was very happy with that because I could do things a bit better and quicker and I would literally pass the pages off to somebody in IT who would then FTP it up to a server somewhere I was allowed to touch that bit uh, but everything else was just me by myself uh, yeah good old days when you, you could you could do everything touch stuff so uh, that's how I got into it and um, years and years uh, of that running hpc.com for about 10 years and then um, we built a bigger team passed it off to other people and they kind of sat me back and said right what do you want to do and I said well I want to build an SEO team and they're like are you sure yeah so built this SEO team around the world um, I had people in China the Philippines um, Sri Lanka and Egypt and I did have somebody in the States for a little while as well and we did huge amounts of SEO for the a lot of the HPC group um, which was very interesting stuff very corporate very interesting um, and that's it two years ago left HPC uh, amicably uh, they paid me off to go away which is nice uh, I've been wanting to, to uh, go freelance for years uh, and I've been doing stuff in you know, as you do and you in your bedroom at night um uh, i've been always doing that since back in the 90s uh doing bits on the side because it helped me with my job like it's the only way to really learn to understand especially with technical seo if you can't build websites what are you doing doing technical seo you need to uh, really understand how the whole thing works uh, apart from javascript which is complete devil's language and, and shouldn't be allowed <laughs> um i don't do javascript so uh, there you go uh, it's proper programming. I don't know how to do that. I could just do markup. Uh, so that was it. Uh, left HSBC and I work with my wife now. We've just set ourselves up a little boutique company and we've got all sorts of interesting um, clients from literally from the flower shop up in the village, um, which d does rather well on the local search, uh, to uh, I work with some agencies doing uh, international hotel SEO and other things that come along. Um, which is great. So to, to kind of deviate, I have it on good authority that you are a train enthusiast and a um, Yeah, be careful here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, well, for a lot of people, put me in a subset of weirdos. Um, <laughs> I'm a nerd and a geek, but I'm not one of them. I build, uh, yeah, I build uh, narrow gauge model railway trains. Um, uh, which are to scale and uh, there's a there's a great deal of precision in them and it's it's not plain trains and stuff it's 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 modeling and i actually prefer the scenery more than i do the the locos and the coaches mm -hmm. um i hope none of my f fellow society members hear me hear this podcast or there's one or two of mine um but yeah it's uh, it's uh, creating miniature versions of of interesting scenes and i i am um, i model narrow gauge for me it's a lot more interesting than standard gauge uh because of the the actual uh, real life situations with them were, were, were so varied that no two narrow gauge lines were alike even in the states where there, there was plenty of narrow gauge lines as well so there was quite a few over here in the uk uh, yeah so i do that and, and that's for me that's really good because that's what i work on digital all day um, 
doing the model railway stuff is it's I do stuff like soldering, which allows me to burn my hands quite badly <laughs> um, and inhale noxious and, and dangerous poisonous fumes, uh, all sorts of things which I can't do uh, on a digital platform. So, yeah, lots of hands on stuff. It's, it's uh, more atoms and pixels, as a friend of mine uh, often said. Yeah, I, I build um, mini drones. Uh, to fly around and wear the FPV goggles and, and like to yeah, do crazy uh, freestyle. And I have a whole workshop behind me also. <laughs> and, oh yeah. you know, soldering and things like that. Like, it's it's fun. Like, I, I kind of go through there. Like, I, I work on a computer all day. And it's kind of good to get away and work with your hands and build, you know, whether it's, you know, trains or, again, my mine are like flying trains in a way. <laughs> uh, I'm not building the scenery and things around that, but I'm also um, – I get to like, kind of create art that way. And, and my art, when I do that is making videos, um, trying to sync my, you know, freestyle flying of a drone up with music. And it's That's not your photography type of drone where you just hover and take a picture. I'm going 80 okay. miles an hour. <laughs> um, so I, like, I learned to be a pilot a little bit, um, I, though I hate to call myself a pilot because that really makes real pilots. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not trying to, <laughs> not trying to say I'm a real pilot. <laughs> Yeah. So, and you don't have any any problems flying over um, kindergarten schools and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not, like I'm I'm usually going to office parks on the weekends, <laughs> <laughs> and and flying through there. The the negative of that is everything's concrete around it. So if I uh, mess up, I'm usually breaking something. But that's part of refixing everything. And um, right, they're okay. they're made of carbon fiber. They're pretty pretty strong. But um, that's awesome. I, I kind of come from a similar background to you, where I was a like kind of a webmaster, built building websites from the ground up. I've um, spent tons of time, like, because I was a designer. I started went to school for actually three D animation. Yeah, yeah. Um, realized I stunk at that. I had Photoshop, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, having Photoshop back then meant that you were a designer, <laughs> um, and yeah. the designers that that were real designers at the time didn't. Um, really see the web as an outlet because um, you know you had different size screens different pixel width like you know if I wasn't giving them the exact you know um, dimensions how many points is this font like I don't know it's 18 pixels <laughs> um, that's, they, that's a fascinating thing to talk about there because uh, I went through the whole of that process where uh, graphic designers were saying well web isn't a real uh, thing it's you know, it's all over the place um, but the disciplines that we put into the web over the years actually now match what we were doing in graphic design before the, the web came along. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're doing exactly the same thing. Yes, we've given it a different set of names for layout, et cetera, but basically we're doing the same thing. Um, so I think it is a really good time to kind of go back and visit uh, great graphic design from the 60s and 70s. Um, and see how we can implement that into websites because nobody is everybody's using wordpress themes which some bloke in his hungarian bedroom is designing and for yeah. ten dollars or whatever Easy. Uh, i see you you used to write or work with uh, a list apart and i know that mm -hmm. huge into that ground um i used to work with jason santa maria and dan mall in the past at a, at a different company and yeah um they really one thing they would teach me is just the design aspect of things, right? I was yeah. doing development. Um, they were real designers that also did front end development. So it really taught me, like I understood design to an extent, but never went to school for design and just working with them and how they meticulously go through fonts and the, how headers look and, and just the usability and readability of stuff. It really helped me out with a lot of my just creativity in general and making well, things. Really working useful. with brilliant people like that, you'll pick up stuff. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. without a shadow of doubt so uh, all that stuff will come through and you'll, you'll be able to take that I, uh, for, for many years I was working in marketing departments in, in HSBC and I, I have a huge knowledge of marketing but I've never done marketing in my life but I know what I need to do to make it work for marketing even though I've never done any really. I've never been paid to do that <laughs> How so yeah you, you pick that stuff up I, I guess I feel like uh a bit of a psycho in that my hobby is running a podcast. Like that's what I do aside from my day job when I could be building, building drones or planes or being a, a master bread maker or yeah, whatever. You, so I guess you have to go out and get some go proper here. pixels. <laughs> I like mowing the yard. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So I guess 
you you were at it, it, SBC, right? I feel like I'm like m mismatching the abbreviation. HSBC. HSB. Now you're confused. Yeah. Now you're confusing me. Hong Kong uh, and Shanghai Banking Corporation was the original one, but when they bought Midland Bank uh, and shifted from Hong Kong to the UK uh, for reasons that uh, China was going to take back Hong Kong and they want to shift all their assets, etc., back to the UK, uh, the UK government said you need to change your name and not be the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. So they just went HSBC. But the amount of people that I know that still call it HSB is untrue. Even people that have been working. Uh, as, um, as uh, agencies working for HSBs for years, <laughs> going to meetings with them, uh, it's like, oh, it's HSB. And I say, you don't really know us that well, do you? <laughs> but that's not a problem. They're not that, uh, they're interesting, they're, they're not that well known in the, in the States as I would like to think. I mean, it's massive in the UK and the rest of the world, but the States, they're, they're there. But... I feel like there's a lot of, lot of competition. Yeah. A lot of competition. Um, what I was going to say, with two two things, how did you? There are many different disciplines of getting into SEO. How did you find that you fell into more of the the technical side? And then what made you? You know, you were there for a long, long time. Hmm. Um, what made you want to want to jump out on your own? Uh, well, frankly, I didn't have any choice of jumping out on my own. Okay. <laughs> uh, there were some changes. But I wanted to do that for years uh, and just didn't have the, the guts to do it. Um, so how I fell into it, because being a webmaster in the early days, you did everything, literally everything. So uh, part of that discipline was SEO, but we didn't know it was called SEO in those days. There's the search engine, let's get ourselves found in it. And that sort of came later on. And there were a lot of other things that were more important in those days, uh, like validation of code, which nobody cares about anymore, but it, it was. Uh, big thing um i forgot what you said for the second bit sorry well the 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 first bit was jumping in and becoming a technical seo like how did you ah, yeah get onto that so the technical side is because i was building websites and at a, a more at home than than at uh, hsbc uh i was building my own website and other sort of for small clients, etc. I got to know content management systems really well. And I was actually to the point where I was specifying them internally in HSBC and, and uh, looking at what we could get out of uh, content management systems. We went through a lot um, in HSBC, uh, most of which were never up to what we really needed. But um, doing that uh, and understanding how websites work and what you need to get them to, to really you know, give the information out to people. When it got to the point where uh, they said, what do you want to do? I, I sat back and thought, well, actually, what we don't have in HSBC is an SEO team. And we didn't. I was the only one at the time. Um, and I said, no, we should do more of this because it's important. And that was, oh, that was back in 2010, I think. And I'd been doing SEO for years, but not as a prime discipline. But as part of what I was doing. Uh, and so they let me build this team up. And... Um, you know, HSBC is a massive brand worldwide. Um, and we lived off that. And they really didn't take any notice of, of SEO at all. And I think that's changed. Certainly was changing the last two years I was there. And people realized that uh, the disruptors were coming in, um, like PayPal, etc., getting banking licenses. And there was potential of stuff like Bitcoin and other stuff coming along, which would, would uh, disrupt it. And, and the big players like HBC really had to change the game. So, so there were people behind that saying, yeah, we need to get some SEO into our sites to, to make sure we keep our dominant position. <laughs> um, and it was, it was tricky. Actually, it, was, it, it wasn't tricky keeping uh, the sites ranking well. That was no problem at all because the brand was so strong. Um, it was tricky getting stuff done. The big old corporate, you can't get anything done troubles, you know, um, Lots of that. Yeah. What are some of your biggest challenges, like working in the banking industry, right? It's, uh, I, there's, I know in the States, and I'm sure everywhere in the world, it's, uh, you're messing with people's money, right? So, and I know you weren't in charge of their money, but being in no. charge of the sites, I know there's lots of loopholes and things like that, that you, you can't really say stuff or do stuff. Yeah, I, I, I understood and, and uh, black hat stuff. Uh, and what people were trying to do to get the stuff to rank. Um, and we could never do anything like that simply. 
well, for many reasons. Um, the PR out of it would be terrible, uh, and I'd have been kicked out immediately. Um, but then we have things like the uh, BMW um, Europe, BMW Europe in uh, what was it, about 2006, maybe a bit later than that. Um, build a set of gateway pages or door, doorways and gateways to their site, and um, got deranked from Google for about six months got a big slap and that was a big wake-up call for, for a lot of people uh, in the, the big industries. Well, a lot of companies, big companies were using agencies still and hadn't brought things in house. And we, obviously we had that. Um, so when that happened, we were like, yeah, we're not doing that <laughs> uh, because that's a bad thing to do. And uh, there are lots of things about banking that, that people say, oh, the bad bankers, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a lot of very, very good, honest people in banking. Right. The vast, vast majority of people I work with, uh, not everybody, but the vast majority I work with were very good. Um, and morally very good, and right moral compasses. So in that situation, we were like, we're not, well, we just won't do that sort of thing. Um, but there were people doing it out there, and we're like, well, we can't do this. So we had to, we had to be creative and, and work within what was tolerable in the law. And banking regulation... Uh, throughout the world is is really tough and i would spend days with with our lawyers uh on calls and you know three four hour meetings every day for weeks going through stuff to launch sites it was horrible because <laughs> the lawyers really are those in those back in those days just didn't know anything about the internet i would like to think they do now but back in those <laughs> days no idea at all and you had to explain everything they'll go was well, this okay like, yeah that's fine uh, is that okay yeah. no <laughs> I used to work a lot in the pharmaceutical industry and um, I remember having to print out websites and fax them to yes. lawyers so that they could um, uh, critique it. And I'm just like, here's a web address. I can't just go to the <laughs> website, but they needed it in print so that they can circle and write things. And um, the couple banks that I have worked with weren't, they weren't so bad. I guess I didn't do a ton. I was just really, it's more of a wording, right? I couldn't say, um, you know, free checking if it wasn't totally free. And, and, you know, I used a lot of their terminologies and yeah, lawyers were involved every step of the way when we, anytime we wanted to update content. Um, I was also lucky in my life that I've got to work with some big brands where I didn't have to do any of that, um, you know, link building tactics that would get companies in trouble. Um, it's, I see every time there's a big update, of course, everyone gets a little, you know, <laughs> anxious when it happens. But at the same time, I like, I know that I'm not out there spending, you know, $20,000 a month um, building links. I've done it before. Um, I actually had some clients that wanted to do big things like that um, in the banking industry, but it was because there was a big merger coming and they wanted to own like the term, you know, free savings account right before the merger so that they could say that. So they spent, gave us, tons of money, which was fun to go and try to do that. But we just knew that it was going to be a, a bad day for them at the end. And um, we didn't know the merger was coming. They did. And that's kind of was the deal that was going on. So, um, but they were also one of those companies that were part of the, the collapse here in the States and um, merged and got bailed out. So that was one of the, you know, some of the fun times that we've had here in the banking industry in the States. Speaking of, you know, the lawyers still, sorry, you know, the lawyers still use faxes? today they, i don't know what's the matter with them but they really i think the, the <laughs> fact that it's really really difficult to intercept and change your facts because it is a facsimile they still like faxes and they still blooming well do it it's incredible sorry uh that you were saying no it's okay i was just gonna say it's funny that you guys bring up kind of the legal aspect it's not something that people think about when they think about seo and i have been with one of my clients in legal update hell for about the last month where we have uh, a lot of content that is mission critical to doing what I need to do on, on the SEO side and what we need to do on the SEO side. But we've been in three or four weeks of legal updates and with the client has kind of a small digital team. So because that lawyers take prior priority, that has definitely been prioritized ahead of my little meager SEO, SEO changes. So it's just funny that that come, comes up. Yeah, and I've been in lawyers like where we submitted a site and you know, we have a deadline that like uh, when I was in the pharmaceutical world that a drug was launching, we needed certain things done. So that like 
11 to 30 at night, the lawyer might've finally got to it and spit it out. And I would be at, back at the office working on things that that was before kind of remote work was actually easier. <laughs> um, but being back at the office, just waiting for that fax. And, and once it was done, we had like 35 minutes to get it done. We had like a certain window. It was kind of like we were launching a rocket. <laughs> it was just like, you have this window to get something done. So Simon, before we kind of move on to the, uh, to the news, how's, uh, how's kind of the, the new business going? What are, what are some of the things you're kind of running into there? That's, uh, yeah, uh, because we are very small, this is in the wife and she does a lot of marketing type stuff and business, uh, molding businesses and talking to them. Um, we're kind of picking up all sorts of work. So there's me off doing international hotel SEO and she's talking to the florist up the road or, uh, organizations down the other, other way, etc. It's fascinating. And I love it because it, it's so, so varied. Um, and I've got to say, working for ourselves is, is great. Um, really, we should be working 24 hours a day servicing our clients, but we don't. We stick our feet up and we have a good time and we just don't take on work because it's there. We just, if we like somebody, we'll work with them. If we don't like them, we just tell them, say, thank you very much. Here, try this person. Um, so we don't have a, a big raft of clients. We, we, we do, really do pick and choose. Um, and I've got to say, we, we are in a very lucky position to be able to do that. Um, most people can't, uh, but, but I'm old and I've amounted some money over the years <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's, it's payback time and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's going well. Uh, we're enjoying it. That's great. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of times and I've thought about, about the same thing kind of going out of my own and I, like you have, have not to this point been, um, willing to, to, take the take the the risk and it sounds like you may may have been kind of forced into taking the, the risk but i was but to be honest i've been waiting for it for years yeah um and because i knew that that leaving a bank i'm going to get a substantially good payoff um which gave me the the the, the fighting fund to actually uh, set myself up and or ourselves up and, and go freelance and i don't you can't do it without that you can't just hope because if you've got mortgages and stuff to pay which we all have um it's difficult. You you got to have a uh, yeah a, a, a treasure chest of, of money you've saved up to make sure that you're okay. If work doesn't come in or people don't pay, etc., it's uh, it can get very difficult. You know, the car breaks down or plane drops something on your roof. Um, I'm um, under the Gatwick flight path here, so uh, I was worried about um, blue ice dropping off planes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the house is cheap. Jeff. It wasn't cool. that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> What's um, in Jeff? Awesome. Well, there was, it wasn't like a huge week this week in, in SEO news, but there were some cool things that were out there. One um, that I'm personally digging through and enjoying is the new version of Screaming Frog was yeah. released to version 12. Um, it had some really good things updated into it. And um, one of the things I, not that I struggle with, but always was trying to find like the best way to report on speed. Um, like how can I get a speed report throughout the whole site? And there's many different ways, you know, with different tools, but now Screaming Frog's another way to add to that. So it hooks into Lighthouse metrics um, and uses the, the Crux data to, to be able to get some of that UX data pulled in from Google Insights. So um, that, that's one awesome thing that with it. Um, have you had a chance to look through it at all, Simon? Yeah, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I, I, I have a little web watcher that just watches uh, if there's any changes to their uh, release page. So I knew something was coming up before they tweeted it. Um, I think it pings off every two hours. So as soon as they oh, nice. page ready, I'm like, yeah, great. And I download immediately. Um, so you are straight in there and find out what's going on. Um, uh, a, f a month ago, they added structured data testing into the tool, which was a great step. And I yep. think they've taken what they've learned from that and said, well, let's, let's go for speed testing with uh, with Lighthouse and whilst I've I've, I've run quite a few uh, crawls this week with with that and got the Lighthouse um, stuff back I have no idea what it means yet it's just rows and rows of numbers <laughs> we're gonna go oh this one's really bad and this one's really good why I don't know and it's a case of going through and looking at that and and seeing how it really helps but being able to look at a whole site that quickly and it really is fast um, and bring that data back from Lighthouse is fantastic which means I don't have to Bang into Chrome developer anymore and, and per page by page and have a right. look. 
bang, it's there, and you can really just dive into what's uh, what's looking not how it should do um, is is a really good thing. So yeah, I, I, literally before um, I, we came on air, I was uh, doing something, and I was I had a problem getting because well, I switched over to the database way of saving the files in there as well mm -hmm. um, there, which is superb because you, you can structure it and organize it by folder as well so you can drag and drop the stuff in there and I thought well hang on a second I need to open up some old uh, screaming frog databases I've got oh, not databases, sorry uh, files that I've got um, for, for sites how do I do that because there's no open anymore it's just the, the crawl button. But there's an import feature further down in the file thing, because I pinged off a support email, to, and Dan came back fairly quickly and said, oh, there's an import thing. Bang, and it works. It works perfectly. And you can bring that. When you, when you then import um, your old uh, files, they actually, it adds it to the database, and it's there. That's great. It is really, really good. And oh, I haven't tested it yet, but I did see an export one as well. So I imagine where stuff gets old and you, your database starts to get rather big, you know, it gets into gigabytes big. Uh, and your, your laptop's screaming with desire to have a bit more space, you can probably export stuff out, out to a, um, an archive somewhere that you don't need anymore. So That's good. It's yeah, good I, know, I know like, you know, one of their competitors now is Sightbulb. Yeah. And Sight, one thing I like about Sightbulb, um, and not even like what the tool crawls and things like that, is that is kind of they work off that database mentality also, and then you can do yeah. comparisons. Like oh, yeah. Last crawl versus crawl. Um, I don't think this version of Screaming Frog does that, but the database storage is awesome. Like I know it's uh, having to save Screaming Frog files <laughs> is a pain in the butt. The only good thing with that is you can share them, but the negative with that is like I'm sharing uh, like a 20 gigabyte file. Um, we have in our office um, a machine that's dedicated for crawling 64 gigabytes of RAM and um, things like that. But now it's, you know, now it seems like it's overkill because the database storage model you don't, I mean, you still need RAM to run it, but it's, you know, you don't need 64 gigabytes of memory to just run a hundred thousand URL site anymore. So that's yeah. a good, a good point because I don't share any of my files because my wife just won't know what to do with them. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell's this? <laughs> read this. Uh, no, uh, uh, yeah, she expects me to, to run through that and stuff and analyze it and then tell her what to tell the client. Uh, she has no idea what to do, and I haven't got anybody else to share them with. So um, I'm quite lucky with that. But yes, and it, that's an interesting point, actually. If you, if you are keeping that stuff in, inside your database yourself, how do you share it with, with colleagues? Exactly. But that's the same as Cybol. Um, but Cybol's brilliant, and I love Cybol, but mm -hmm. especially the guys um, that run it uh, who invited me to the UK search awards last year and we had a very very jolly time uh, great. lots of beverages um, it was, it was uh, and it's a great tool really really good tool and it, it kind of breaks boundaries in the way that the first one would come out with the, uh, uh, the, you know, the the graph mapping things which is really useful everybody's yeah. doing that now but um, yeah no, they're, they're, it's a great tool. And, and I love it just, you know, just because of that, like the graphing of it, they now kind of give the ratings of the different sections, which is kind of what I usually take the report and make a rating off of that, <laughs> like of what I think about it so that they add that in there, which is great. Um, yeah, I am uh, personally excited about the time savings. <laughs> I, I spent and I, I have my own like special spreadsheet, which pulls in web page tests. Google page speed insights, uh, GT metrics, basically all my favorite speed tools and not having to go one by one by one. I don't know what I'm going to do with all of the extra time, all of the extra time that I'm going to have on my hands, yeah. maybe do something else useful, but, um, well, analyze it. <laughs> oh yeah. Analyze it. I don't know if you guys <laughs> find this, but I've been like battling for, I feel like now years, uh, with respect to, to site speed. And um, the battle is that everybody knows it's important. Nobody wants to do anything about it. And it literally makes me pull my, my hair out, especially when I've gone to like huge organizations and say, hey guys, improve your speed by like a second and you can make like a couple million extra dollars. No, they just laugh me out of the room. But I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I've, I've constantly had that problem. And uh, in HSBC, we the, everything was organised in such a way that our development teams uh, were basically were part of IT and had a book. And every time I went to them and said, "We need this," 
that book was shut for the next year. So it, it was so difficult to get resource to actually go and build anything we wanted. A really good example of that. Um, one of the last projects I worked on before I left, um, and I worked on it for about two years, was uh, the HBC Asset Management set of websites. It was one website with lots of countries as sub uh, folders within that and they wanted to split them out into subdomain oh, sorry into local domains which made a lot of sense at the time um, whether it does now or not I don't know I don't care they're not paying me um, so we had about 32 websites and in a multitude of languages and I can't remember what they all were to be honest I remember there was probably 20 different languages probably slightly less than actually that um, but uh, we shifted over from the content management system we had, which I, it was an IBM one, I can't remember what it was, WebSphere, I think, uh, with Envision on the back end of it or something, um, over to Cycle. And as part of that, I said, okay, let's, let's build ourselves a hreflang tool. So as we go and deploy each site, we can add all the hreflang in for each, each site, because basically the content was the same on every, every site, but just in different languages for the different countries, etc., and slight variations. Uh, in content here and there and stuff and they uh, I waited for six months and they came back so we can't do it for another year so what we did we went and built our own excel macros a set of spreadsheets and would manually push this stuff out and then we would actually push it up in the content management system as a text file or an xml file uh, via the cms and tell google where our href lang files were because they weren't in the normal place and you could do that. And that's the, if you look at the, the sites, you go, oh, they haven't got any href lang. Yes, we have. You just can't see it. It's down there. And literally, and it's still not there now. So there's been at least three and a half years. And that resource still hasn't been made available. Yeah. Not mainly because I'm obviously not there banging the drum. Right. Um, but that's a really good example of, of trying to get resource in any big corporation, or any small corporation, to be honest. I've worked in other places. Uh, since then that um, where getting resources is just very very difficult for SEO it's not seen as being uh, the bottom line uh, bringing money in I think that's changing I think people are realizing a lot more SEOs are coming in house um, over the last few years and that's I think that's because companies are realizing they need to spend money on SEO uh, and it I've seen situations where they've actually had dedicated devs sitting with an seo team and, and where that w works it works really really well but even in those situations uh getting resource and time is is difficult because devs devs minds are i know a lot of devs and i work with them they're they're elsewhere they don't care about seo it's like a little take it's like accessibility same thing it's like right. oh, do we have to do that <laughs> yeah implementation it's the biggest challenge we we face and the funny thing is like we are struggling all the time with implementation but one thing i constantly constantly get is why aren't the results like x or what's going on with this why isn't this moving or whatever and it's it's not a valid answer to point back to well you didn't implement my recommendations <laughs> or it took <laughs> six months or whatever so yeah. But people forget also that the competition is doing the same thing at the same time. Right. Plus, Google's changing everything every single day, several multiple yeah. times a day as well. Yeah. Uh, it gets very, very difficult. And there are there are many marketing departments that still hang on rankings, and they're sitting there every day and go, "Well, our rankings have gone up today." Uh, there was a there's a UK company uh, called Strategic uh, who uh, brought out a tool last year that did hourly tracking on rankings and i was lucky to get on the beta on that and it was absolutely mad yeah we, i did a small test about i don't know 20 keywords or something and you could see the top three uh terms were were bounced around a little bit but the further you got away from the, the top three it was all over the place and google is just testing constantly Mm -hmm. which means any ranking tool that comes back and says, oh, you're at this position today, it depends when they go and test it because mm -hmm. they're not averaging it. They're not testing it every minute and averaging it and saying, this is, this is roughly where you are. No, not at all. When and where. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't believe rankings at all anymore. That doesn't go down well with clients. Oh, they want to be number one. <laughs> <laughs> it is tough. And I'm lucky that I have some clients where rankings aren't, I mean, we like to, I like to look at them as a whole and see if things are moving, but 
um, I try to get away from like those single terms that we, we want to do well on. Um, I do have one that has a, a very specific term and he checks it every day. <laughs> and if he's, he doesn't need to be number one. He just needs to be in the top five and he's happy. Um, oh, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And it, it's because it's a, it's a term that's near and dear. It's like they're, it's kind of a product that they've made, but other people sell it. So if he's getting beat out by Amazon, he doesn't care, but he just wants to be up there um, because either way he makes the money, but it's just one of those ego terms. I call them that, that they like to do. Um, but yeah, I try to, st- I, I try to stay away from, we run ranking reports of course, but I, I definitely like to look at them as a whole and like, here's a group of terms, maybe for a category. And is that category doing better or worse? Um, but there's so many variables like with personalization and stuff that it's really hard to, to really take, take that information and say, this is exactly what is happening right now. Right. So. I've been doing a lot of local over the last year and um, <laughs> say for the florist shop up the road, et cetera. Um, and it's fascinating. If you can get up into that, map packer three sometimes four um you can really increase your business a lot especially with local because people just don't look beyond that map pack and it, yeah. getting all that in line and, and working well is, is it's not a skill it's just knowing all the little bits and pieces that help yeah. um but uh, i have i'm frustrated there's one particular small company um who i'm has frustrated me for and i'm doing loads of work for free on this because I literally just want to make him number one. And he's just constantly two and three in the map pack uh, against somebody who's constantly number one, whose website is the worst website I've seen in my life. It's, it, it, for, until very recently, his H1 said title. It wasn't even a product or anything. It was just, yes. <laughs> it was just like, how is he ranking? <laughs> well, I sort of worked it out, yeah. It's just so annoying. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just when you fun. think you know, just when you think you know everything, then there's like a site like that you're just like how is this working yeah i think that's the same with all of us as well it's yeah. everything's changing so much um just trying to consume all the what's what's changing and, and looking at all the seo uses every day and, and trying to understand how things have changed it's really difficult this, this day and age it's you know 10 years ago it was like seo yeah i'll read that once a month yeah. um and you you understand where things have gone these days um the only way I can keep up with it is keep up on Twitter uh, with the masses of people I follow and see what the clever people are looking at and right. say, oh, read this. And like, uh, if it's not for them, I, if it's not in Twitter and somebody's saying this is good, I don't, I don't go out and read stuff. I've right. got time. I use a, a program or an, a site called Nuzzle and Nuzzle takes all, the, like, takes all my tweets and all the people I follow and groups them in like, oh, 50 people retweeted this. Pretty so it must be more important than, than other things. And so um, it's usually Barry Schwartz articles, all of them. So I can just go to his site, <laughs> <laughs> read them. Cause it seems like everyone retweets his right away. But um, so oh, I, met, I met Barry earlier this year. He has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> he's, just great. he's pushing the right buttons the right time. He just, just fell on his feet. He's a very lucky man. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, also in the tool world, there is a new tool that was kind of announced called sunlight metrics. I don't know if you've heard about them. They're they're um they're claiming, and it's not even out yet. I I, I think me and and Jacob both both signed up for uh waitlist. Yeah, the waitlist. But it's supposedly a log file analyzer that doesn't need log files. Where I, I don't know how they're doing it. If it's a piece of JS that they're putting it out, it's a piece of JS, and they're analyzing the uh, the bot traffic as it's crawling your site, as opposed to like having the physical log file so interesting concept well that's obviously rubbish it, it very well very well could be <laughs> it sounds like it might be what if the job's <laughs> file doesn't fire yeah it looks like somebody's come up with something no uh logs are incredibly important and i always go on a bang on about this it. it, it's really difficult to get hold of logs but they are so important to understand what traffic is coming to your site that i've recently switched my personal site from craft to kirby um for various reasons, but uh, one tool I've used in both is Retour. Um, the Craft plugin for Retour is brilliant. Um, and fortunately for me, there's a Retour plugin for Kirby as well. And what that does is allows, it basically maps everything that's been asked for on the site and gives you a failure list. And then you can then go map it to somewhere you want to. So you put redirects in, but you're getting to see without looking at the logs, all the, uh, the URLs that have been asked that are failing. Uh, and the problem with, if you're not looking at the logs and stuff, uh, really, 
you're not going to get all that information and the amount of wordpress urls that have been hit on my site which has never had wordpress on it um is incredible so there's obviously people in nefarious places in the world that are just pounding everything in the world and see where the vulnerabilities are so they can yeah. chuck their paid links in i'm assuming they're paid links because i don't do any of that so <laughs> yeah no it, it, it was it's always interesting where um you know on sites that i have just how are people trying to get to these pages and where is it coming from? Like this page never existed ever. And there's just gotta be a ton of bot machines out there that are just hitting that type of stuff, trying to find vulnerabilities, I guess. It's a it's an interesting world that's, I want to meet somebody who does it just to, uh, <laughs> to talk to them and just understand why. And if it is just to put, you know, Viagra ads on my page, then, because I've had like a WordPress site taken over and, I found out that in my old hometown, I ranked number one for like Viagra and you know, the name of the town. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, cause somebody who was doing some research let me know. And I'm like, Oh, that I got hit with one of those. Someone, you know, took my system over and only gave it to Google bot. I'd never even noticed it. Um, so it was a very interesting time. Um, and then the, you know, it was weird trying to get it out of the site because they somehow really got into the core and, and I couldn't like, I had to delete everything and start again. That's one of the reasons I don't use WordPress. Um, I'm, it's a fantastic tool. And yes, the, I, I do SEO for a list apart and that's just shifted onto WordPress uh, earlier this year. Um, but it's the VIP WordPress, it's pretty good stuff. Um, but most WordPress setups aren't looking at it all every day making sure that everything's okay so you things can happen like that people can have vulnerabilities and yeah, yeah with, with those plugins it's, it's fantastic you're like oh i can do this i can i can have a table of contents bang there you go just press a button uh, or tick a box and you get a table of contents and um, but yeah. what you don't know underneath that is somebody's got a back door in which is why um i have been using content management systems over the years which uh, I tend to focus on ones which are, really do separate the data away from the, the presentation layer. So I'm talking here Expression Engine. I use Expression Engine for years and years. I do use it for some clients still. Uh, and then I jump to Perch uh, for small sites. Again, same thing. And Craft because Craft came out of Expression Engine. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the guys who developed that were Expression Engine developers and uh, plugin developers. Um, and they didn't like the way expression engine was going so they did their own one and, uh, but craft is very very devy it's all very composer led etc which yeah. is not my cup of tea which is why i switched my site eventually to kirby um having that split between your data and your your presentation layer really does separate the two and you don't get that in wordpress but now of course wordpress has got gutenberg as well which still blocks and everything all these systems have had that for years and the fact you can make up your own templates in the background in the back end rather. And I do that all the time for our clients, our small clients. Uh, yeah, we're building templates for them to change their pages. They can get in and do it. Most of the time though, they pay us to do it. So I just make it easier for my wife to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but that sort of stuff is important to, to put together. And it, for me is if you know what you've put together, you know what shouldn't be there. And you know, that's yeah. why people can get in with WordPress and, and change stuff because people have, that chucking up a WordPress site don't know what's actually in there. Yeah. So that's it's just thing. so easy. Yeah. I can, I can push a button with my host and have a new site up in 10 minutes. Yeah. That's basically <laughs> what we did with, with the, the page two podcast website, which yeah. uses WordPress, which it will probably get hacked at some point, but <laughs> we'll be we called it page three. <laughs> so you y'all mentioned a lot of platforms. So I feel like that is a good segue um, replatforming. What do you guys think of when I say replatforming? <laughs> uh, you take your WordPress content and stick it on something else. Is that what you mean? <laughs> I usually think uh, ominous. Uh, ominous use usually comes to mind, like especially if you're trying to do replatforming and and or redesign or migration. And basically, any any moving uh, or changing of of a website. Um, pretty, pretty ominous and um, pretty, pretty daunting is what typically comes to mind when I hear brands mention that they're, they're thinking about it. I don't know how you guys feel. Well, for me, um, it's fantastic doing a migration where somebody's staying on the same platform um, and they're just switching a few bits and pieces over. Um, but what often happens is you will get somebody going, well, we need to go and 
stick it on this new platform because that's now the group standard or the company standard and we need to shift right. over to that. Let's use this as an opportunity to redesign it. Way. Um, and then the second thing is, while we redesign it, we'll change all the content as well. And uh, as an SEO, you're sitting there going, oh my God, everything's changing. Yeah. Um, it can be managed, but if you're not in there at the beginning of the process, uh, telling them what they need to really think about, um, et cetera, if you're brought in two weeks before they launch, or worse, two weeks after they've launched, you've got one hell of a task on your hands. You really oh, have. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. happened to me a lot of times. So they said, oh, yeah, we've launched and um, our traffic seems to have plummeted. It's like, well, I wonder why. <laughs> and a very good example of that, um, and I'm not going to drop anybody's names into this, but uh, after I stopped running HPC.com and it was passed out to other teams to, to the, within the unit I was in to, to run it, they did do exactly that. They did a platform change and a design change. And I said, you need to redirect all the URLs. And this was like 12, 1400 URLs in the site. Uh, they decided to redirect the top 200 only. And for the next two years, the traffic on HPC.com plummeted to a third of what it was when I was running it um, and never regained anything like it was before. But nobody that's, cared. That's sad. Oh, oh, after me, yeah. and I was like, yeah, I read it much better. <laughs> because well, the, the thing about that is like when that happens, especially for companies that depend on that traffic for, for business, yeah. that, that has a real world implication. Like yeah. that probably costs some people their, their jobs. And, and, and I, and I always say like at the outset of any project like this, like, look, business owner brand, you think of me as somebody that's going to grow your web, your, your, your traffic, right? That's what people think of SEOs. Well, you need to erase that for right now. When we go through this project, my goal is to protect your traffic and help you not drop off a cliff flat. I, a client once said this to me and it's beautiful because I, because I, I've used it over and over again. Flat is the new up, right? So when you're, when you're going through a, a major change like this, like just maintaining stability is a really, really good thing. Now, hopefully you're doing this replatform and redesign to ultimately allow yourself to grow long term. And that certainly would be the goal for the SEO people too. But simply getting through and making sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot or feet uh, is, is, is pretty much the goal. Yeah, I mean, there was a time where, you know, we, we would tell clients, hey, we're gonna see a 30 to 50% decrease for three months and, and things like that. and. Um, you know, Google's gotten a lot better at that if you hand them the right, you know, things, right? So we're not changing every bit of content and we're just updating a content, you know, management system. Um, you know, yeah, we can actually launch and be flat, you know, and, that, and that's great because we're not losing that and we're having to wait three months for anything. Um, but it all depends on, on what's going on. Even if we do change content, it all depends on the content we had before, right? We can always change it to, for the better but changing everything at once can be, you know, a shock to the system. And that's one of the things that, you know, as a technical SEO trying to, you know, not have that big a shock. I mean, I think most of my replatforms end up like, we're just going to upgrade our platform. And then once the developers go in there, they're like, you know, our templates don't work with this. And next thing they're doing is a redesign. And then of course, while they're redesigning, like, well, let's just change the wording of the site. And it's like, <laughs> um, so I, luckily I'll, if I get in there, you know, when it's all happening, you know, six months ahead of time or whenever that's, that's great. But far too many times I get called in six months after when traffic is down, you know, for 50% and, and they are like, what happened? So aside from the, the obvious need for like, Hey, bring the SEOs in early on so that we can be side by side. Um, if, if you're a brand listening to this podcast right now, or if you're somebody that works for a brand or, or whatever, uh, what advice would you give to that person? And what are like the biggest things that you've seen go wrong? Like top of the list. Oh, uh, well, uh, besides, but I'm going to go back to it and say, getting yourself into those initial meetings um, is incredibly important. And actually quite hard because normally you won't know they're happening. Somebody's just gone off and said, oh, I have this idea and this. You know, it, um, but as soon as you find out, get in there uh, and start 
bang on the table and say, you, you need to include me or my team, some of my team on this. You need to think about these things. Uh, and I think that's a really a case of, you can preempt that by sending around notes to people saying, um, well, you've done a migration that's worked really well and this is, this is why it's worked or what we need to think about when you do that migration. Um, one of my top tips on that is that I always map all the URLs in a site. That's absolutely everything. Um, from well, obviously not just the pages, but the images, the JavaScript, the CSS, the whole lot, anything, PDFs, especially PDFs, especially if you then drop the links, but leave the PDFs on the server uh, and people find those PDFs and then sue you because the information in those PDFs uh, <laughs> um, cause somebody to make the wrong investment uh, and they take you to court, which has uh, happened. And uh, that was very funny. No, I wasn't involved with that, but I was picked up to pieces. But yeah, um, it's difficult, but you really, really do need to, to map the whole lot out. Um, and if you've got those maps, if you're doing that on a regular basis anyway, because um, sometimes we don't get the chance to understand what new content's been put on the site on a regular basis. Usually it's okay because it's just the blog, etc. cetera. Um, but it, I would, if you're in house, I would be uh, certainly suggesting mapping your site on a monthly basis, uh, you know, just, or even a weekly one, just a screaming frog it or, or a site bulb or deep crawl or whatever. Um, just so you've got uh, an indication of what you're actually dealing with. So when those things happen, uh, when people start doing that, you can, you, at least you've got a starting point. Jeff, what about, what about you, Ian? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, with, with any of it, I think it's, you know, again, we'll keep saying it, get in there early as much as you can, but um, really want to, you know, the mapping aspect is definitely something I, I want to do. I also like, I like to get in, when we're in early looking at wireframes, right? And because number one thing that I'm always, uh, I'm not all about SEO or, or content just for content sake on pages, but working in a lot of the e-commerce world, um, I'll just get in these wireframes and I'm like, well, where's the content go? And it's like, well, right there, it's the, the title or the header. I'm like, well, where's some content go? Like where, how are we engaging with our customers and where are we putting that? You know, Google needs something to read. Again, I, I don't need a Wikipedia article, but we need a spot to, at least have content. And, I, and as a designer, I know designers love um, imagery and imagery is great. It makes, you know, gives you feelings. Um, but if there's no words that go on that, um, the, you know, the battle we always have is that people don't read the web pages anymore. So we, we you know, want to have small bits of content, which is all great. It's like, we just need to have those small bits of content and we can have multiple small bits of content to be able to get a message across. Um, there are people who do like to read and Google's one of them, right? They're the uh, largest blind user on the internet, so they can't really see the pictures. So we need to at least you know explain what's going on in the page. Um, and if we are doing a migration and we have great content already and we're ranking, like knowing this is where rankings do come in, <laughs> into play. Like if we know we're ranking well for certain pages and certain keywords, like we want to make sure that like I prioritize those lists of pages. So um, I want to map everything out, but I also want to make sure that, hey, these five categories are 80% of our traffic let's not rock the boat as much on those if we can and maybe pull that same content in. make I'm somebody who likes to have like, let's keep the same title tag for now. That's something we can change in the future. <laughs> if we're going to change content on the page, let's keep the same title tag or, or something like that. So that way it's easier for Google to map everything there. Um, but from that, I, I, you know, it's, I feel like even if we have everything down the way we wanted to go, it's like, there could always be that one thing. I mean, I run Screaming Frog through a, a new site a million times, run deep crawl through QA servers and, and like that. But as um, soon as we launch, it's one of those where it's just being, this is where hourly rankings, maybe not, <laughs> but I do look at things like on a daily basis because I want to make sure if I see anything start going down, that we can address it right away. So, so I'll see what you guys are saying and I'll raise you one. So uh, obviously the content is very important and still you have to have a, a content if you want to rank for a specific thing. Redirects probably the most important, but one thing I just went through with a, a major, major retailer is they have had a bunch of content and they, we had a redirect strategy in place. They wanted to rely less on one-to-ones because the system just didn't support more than a certain amount and more on like regex, which was fine. 
we can work around that. But they, they did use it as a bit of an excuse to make the decision not to carry all the content over. Content that for us was critical and was within kind of that upper crust of pages driving traffic. And the decision making was a little bit arbitrary because sometimes decision making comes from much higher above and uh, sometimes comes without data informing those decisions. And then uh, another function, which I did not expect with such a large organization, was that the, the team of people moving the content from old platform to new platform didn't have the capacity to move it all. So like no matter how, like if they were working every hour of every day just on moving content, they didn't have the capacity to do it because they just didn't have enough people. So we had to go uh, get into an exercise where we really had to help them prioritize which content got moved over and was present at launch, which meant that a certain portion of content that was critical to performance, no matter what we did, we did every other thing right, was not gonna get moved over. And that was a huge problem. Now, luckily we solved it quickly after launch, but we were like, honestly, we were really, were, really worried that like, hey, like you're not moving over 30 or 40% of your content, like that's going to be a problem. Um, so we were definitely sounding, sounding the alarm bells on, um, on that one. And that's just not something people talk about a lot is the actual transition and migration of the actual content. They talk mostly about redirection, but sometimes not all the content makes it over, which is crazy. It is crazy. And um, have you, either of you read my article on migration tracking in, uh, Google Data Studio. It's on my site, simoncox.com. Uh, it's, it's on the homepage and article link. Um, and that's a way of tracking the stuff, uh, the tracking before and afterwards, and making sure you don't get that, uh, or whatever it does, track that drop and not, or not, and uh, see what's going on. But uh, what I'm going to coming to here is that sometimes it doesn't matter if it does drop, because if you redesign your site, you might be targeting it at a better audience than you had before. And I have an example with HSBC we have with this. With HSBC.com, it is a global website. And the majority of the traffic was from the US. And there was a separate US site where they could go and do the banking. Um, we got charged, cross-charged internally for searches uh, because the search was done on the server and its CPUs run over, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and it was costing us quite a lot. So we said, okay, how can we reduce the amount of searches that people are doing? And, and we looked at it and said, well, the majority of the searches are from people from the US looking for internet banking. So I designed and stuck a great big red button on the top right hand corner that said, log in. And it killed the amount of money we had to pay on searches because everybody came to the US went, oh, that's it, bump, and off they went. Um, and if you understand what your audience is and then you just do something like that, uh, it doesn't matter that we had fundamentally a lot less page views because we were actually putting the audience where they needed to go and reducing our costs. So for us, it's having those KPIs is far more important. And that's what marketing deal with anyway. Uh, and a lot of SEOs need to get out of the, the migration thing where you're seeing and making sure it come back. Well, most of the time that we do want that and, and it should be like that. But there are occasions where um, as long as what you're seeing from the bottom line and profits, et cetera, is continuing to rise or it needs to be, it's okay. Um, and maybe with the HBC site that we only, um, we only redirected 200 URLs instead of 1200. Uh, actually what happened there was that a lot of the 200 did cope and it was, we had the right traffic. Um, yeah. Okay. The, the traffic dropped a lot, but actually it was the right traffic that was still coming in. It was the journalists and investors and, and people that wanted the information. It wasn't people trying to log onto their banking systems, et cetera. So <clears throat> you brought up a good, a good point um, in terms of looking at some of the, the, those top line metrics. And I, I know I've run into situations where like when you're dealing with leadership or, or C-suite C folks, um, they judge a, sometimes it's ill-advised, but they judge the entire program's performance on those top line metrics visits, not necessarily the conversions in, in the actual bottom line. How do you, how do you handle that when that happens? <laughs> when you have a situation like you had where you, you did it on purpose. 
Uh, yeah. Well, we tell them they're idiots and they should be looking at this. Um, and, <laughs> and that's why I'm now freelance. Right. Uh, <laughs> really, uh, when it comes to C-suite, et cetera, you need to start building out dashboards that really just deliver to them uh, what they need to know and not get into detail. It's when you get into teams that are working for the C-suite, you need to get more in, more detail. In them. And the people that are working for them, even more details. So it's really making sure that your analytics and your data is aimed at the right audience so what you want to see and with something like a c-suite if, if they come in and look at the graph going down they're going well this is terrible the graph's going down you say well actually this is the bounce rate <laughs> as a really bad example this is a good thing so it's the way you present that information and you make sure that when you go into a meeting with the c-suite that you know exactly what is going to happen you know exactly what you're going to tell them and you know exactly what they're expecting to see and, and etc and you do that by making sure you have meetings beforehand with the people that work for them etc and, and um and make sure everything's smooth as a lily great advice yeah. sage advice so <laughs> so simon where can people find you at uh, simoncox.com of course we all own our own domain names don't we I, I I certainly do, Jeff. I do mine, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So. <laughs> we all we we were not uh, idiots, and and we did uh, <laughs> let somebody else get the domain name. Wait, actually, I I did that. <laughs> I, I do own my own my own domain name, although there are uh, Jacob Stutzes, but I I'm I'm the one that got it. There was but, a time I let mine lapse, and that's right after the Viagra people. <laughs> took everything, and I was just like, I took the site down, and then by accident, I let it lapse, and had someone buy my domain name and try to sell it back to me. Um, but that lasted about a year and then uh, they just let it go and then I just picked it up again. But <laughs> it was interesting. You can also, you can also find me on Twitter. Uh, again, at Simon Cox, because I was first in there. Thank you very much. Nice. Um, and uh, you will find me a lot uh, during the week doing Twitter chats for SEMrush, uh, SEO chat on Thursdays and a few others as well. Ecom chat on Mondays, UK time midday, which is before you're up, but that's very good for ecom stuff as well. So, yeah, I'm mainly on Twitter. I dumped Facebook and Instagram last year, a uh, year before actually. Even. Um, I got fed up with it. I might have to dive back in for, for work purposes, but uh, I, from a personal point of view, I don't do those anymore. Right. Uh, but yes, Twitter's the main thing, as, as it is, I think, for most SEOs. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's huge. What is it? Tick, tick tock and uh, Instagram maybe, maybe good with, uh, <laughs> with those youngins, but Twitter's still, uh, still the main place for, for SEO chats, at least as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for taking, taking time and joining us and being candid. We really appreciate it. It's wonderful. I'm really glad I won't be back next week. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. We will. <laughs> We're moving on. That 20 minutes really <laughs> seems to go a long, long way. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's been really enjoyable. Thanks, guys. It's, yep. it's, it's good. Thank you. Thank you.